Hello, and welcome to this National MS Education Awareness Month teleconference, hosted by MS Focus, the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation, and made possible with the support from EMD Serrano, Genentech, Mylan, and Sanofi Genzyme. I'm your host, Chris Payne, editor at MS Focus, the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation, and I'm joined here by Dr. Aaron Boster, who will be talking to us about progressive MS. There are no slides accompanying tonight's presentation, but at the end of the presentation, we will have a question and answer discussion where questions may be submitted using the online chat feature. So we encourage you to connect to the conference online. Go to readytalk.com and join with the access code 7766805. That's readytalk.com. Click join and use the access code 7766805. Feel free to submit your questions as we go, and we will answer those questions for you at the end of the talk. Now let me introduce our speaker. Aaron Boster is a clinical neuroimmunologist specializing in multiple sclerosis. As, in, as a neuroimmunologist, Dr. Boster provides diagnosis and treatment for all types of MS, as well as a wide range of neuroimmunological conditions. Dr. Boster is board certified by the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology and is a member of the American Academy of Neurology and a member of the Consortium of MS Centers. He is the system's medical chief of neuroimmunology and the director of the Multiple Sclerosis Center at Ohio Health in Columbus, Ohio. He has conducted extensive research and is well published in the field of MS over the last 15 years. He is a fierce advocate for people impacted by MS. He also enjoys spending time with his wife, two children, weightlifting, playing tennis, I mean, sorry, playing chess, and likes trying new foods. You can follow him on Twitter at Ohio Health MS, on Facebook at Ohio Health MS Center, and on YouTube you'll find his channel at Aaron Boster MD. Aaron Boster, thank you for being with us, and I'll turn it over to you. Howdy, everyone. Thanks for learning about MS with me, Aaron Boster. And Chris, thank you for that fantastic introduction. Guys, I am super excited for today. This month and this day are special. It's March, which means it's MS Awareness Month. And it's our goal to energize, empower, and educate people impacted by MS across the globe. Today, the 28th of March, is a particularly special day. We're celebrating a recent phenomenal accomplishment we're now starting to beat up the most challenging form of MS, progression. And today, March 28th, is National MS Progressive Day, or Progressive MS Day. I probably said that wrong. We're being hosted today by the MS Foundation, and I want to give a warm thank you from the bottom of my heart for inviting me to talk with everyone. Now, Chris and I were discussing ahead of time, and I said, Chris, we have to have time for questions. And he said, Aaron, I'm not sure if we're going to have a lot of questions. And so I made him a gentleman's bet, but I'm not playing fair. I want you guys to ask questions. Remember, you can log on to ReadyTalk, and that access code is 7766805. So as I'm chit-chatting with you and as you have questions, pretty please submit them. I'm going to look forward to answering them in the latter half of the hour. Now, that introduction um, included a lot of really big words like neuroimmunology. Uh, in essence, I am an MS neurologist. I spend my day fighting MS and trying to make people the most awesome version of themselves despite having this disease. What the introduction left out was the fact that I made the decision to become an MS doctor at age 12. My Uncle Mark had MS from my earliest childhood memory. I literally do not remember my uncle when he didn't have multiple sclerosis. Now, at age 12, he had had MS for quite some time. In fact, he was fixed in a wheelchair at that point, living at my grandparents' house. And on this particular day, which I'll never, ever forget, I was at my grandparents' house. I walked into the kitchen, and there is my grandmother, Nini, and my mother. And they're sitting there, and they're crying. Now, they weren't crying because Uncle Mark had MS in the other room. He had had MS for a long time. They were crying because they were scared, and they couldn't get a hold of their freaking doctor. 
Now, guys, this predates organizations like the MS Foundation, who are amazing advocates and amazing resources for people impacted by MS. And I want to call them out as being a powerful, positive force in this community. And I am grateful for your presence. But going back to when I was 12, that didn't exist. And my parents, my grandparents were scared, and they felt alone, and they felt helpless. Now, my family is educated. My family had resources, and yet they didn't know what to do. And I told my mother then at age 12 that I was going to learn to do it better. I was going to learn to do it better than the men that were taking care of my uncle. Now, I didn't know at age 12 what the heck I was saying. I didn't know that I would be bald by the time I finished my training or that I would literally complete the 27th grade. All I knew was no one should make my family feel that scared and alone. No one should make any family feel that helpless and alone. In this month, this month of MS awareness, this day, this day of progressive MS is a wonderful opportunity to fight back. Now, my Uncle Mark passed away, so did my grandparents. But guys, they're here with us today. And if they could be here in person, I think they would celebrate with us. Today, we're going to be talking about progressive multiple sclerosis. And in order to do so, we have to start by understanding what MS is and what it does. So in order to understand multiple sclerosis, we have to understand the immune system. Now, the immune system is the part of our body that fights off foreign invaders like uh, bacteria and fungi and parasites and viruses. And they're made up of little white blood cells. So the little white blood cells, they, they're born in our bone marrow. And they leave the bone marrow and they go in the blood and they're kind of like college freshmen. They have no clue what they want to be when they grow up. But they all go to school at T-Cell University. Now, T-Cell University is up in the thymus in your neck. And T-Cell University is a very weird university. I want to explain why. First of all, it's completely free. So very, very unusual here in the United States to have free access to a university, but T-Cell University, any, any cell can go. The second thing is there's only one class. There's only one course offered at T-Cell University, and that course is can you differentiate self versus non-self? Now, what I mean by that is if we show one of these T-Cell University students, one of these little white blood cells that's growing up, a, a piece of you, your own body, can the T-cell identify it as being part of you, part of self? Or if we show the T-cell a bad guy, a virus or a bacteria, can the T-cell identify that as being foreign? And if you can pass that class and you graduate, the other weird thing about T-cell university is it only prepares you for one job, soldier. Quite literally, all the cells that graduate from T-cell university up in the thymus become soldiers, and they tool around the human body looking for bad guys. And when they see one of their own selves, they say, hey, me, nice to see me. I hope me's doing well today. But if they see a virus, they stop what they're doing. They take a picture, which they keep for the life of the human being. They call all their friends over and show their friends the picture, and then together they beat the snot out of the virus. Now, when someone tells you that you can't get chicken pox twice, they're actually lying. You can get chicken pox hundreds of times. The second time you get chicken pox, your immune system has made an arsenal specifically geared towards whooping the virus, and it clears it from the body before you even know it. Now, that's the way the immune system is supposed to work. But let's go back to T-Cell University for a second. What happens, guys, if a cell fails? What happens if one of those young, aspiring white blood cells can't differentiate self from non-self? Remember how I said it's a very weird university? Here's the biggest part. They take you out back and they shoot you. Quite literally, if you can't pass the test, they murder you. Only cells that can differentiate self versus non-self are allowed to survive. And so in theory, all the graduates from TSO University can perform this function of identifying bad guys and leaving us alone. Every once in a while, however, there's a mistake. The university goofs up and they by accident graduate a cell that failed. They forget to take him out back and shoot him. And this cell didn't learn his lesson. And he can't differentiate self from non-self. And he graduates with all of his buddies and he's excited and they all graduate and they become soldiers. And he's now a soldier and he's tooling around the human body. But when he sees part of you, self, 
he thinks he's looking at a foreign invader, and he does what he was trained to do. He takes a picture of it, keeping a memory for the life of you. He shows all his friends, and together they attack what they think is a foreign invader, a virus, or a bacteria, when in reality, they're attacking part of you. Now, this is called autoimmunity, when your immune system by accident attacks yourself. And if the attack occurs in the pancreas, we have a term for that. It's called childhood diabetes. That's an autoimmune condition targeting the pancreas. If the attack occurs in the joint, that's called rheumatoid arthritis, which is another autoimmune condition. Today, we're talking about multiple sclerosis, which is an autoimmune condition that attacks the holiest of holies, the supercomputer, the brain that runs the entire body, and the superhighway, the spinal cord that takes all the information from the brain back down to the feet and up. And that is really the essence, the underpinning of what's going on in the setting of multiple sclerosis. It's an autoimmune attack on the brain and spinal cord. Now, today's topic is on progression. But before we can launch into a discussion of progression, I need to clear up some terminology. And so I'm going to introduce the first term of the evening, and that term is called activity. When I say the word activity, I'm talking about either a clinical attack where the immune system, which lives in the bloodstream, crosses the blood-brain barrier, sees part of your brain or spinal cord, thinks it's a foreign invader, and attacks it with inflammation, causing a clinical event. You go blind in your left eye because of a left eye optic neuritis. God forbid you lose feeling and function in your right leg because of a spinal cord attack, etc. And the, the term activity represents clinical disease activity, clinical attacks, flares, exacerbation, relapses. Those are all the same thing. But that is not the only uh, thing that activity represents. Activity can also be asymptomatic. It can be silent. It can be unknown to the human. And you can see this on the MRI. When you get an MRI and you have a new white spot that wasn't there last year, that is evidence of activity. Because at some point, that immune system crossed the blood-brain barrier from the bloodstream into the brain or spinal cord and caused a focal bout of inflammation, which caused damage. It's brain damage, guys. We talk about lesions. We talk about spots. But what we really need is to call it what it is, brain damage. And when you see new brain damage, new bright spots on your MRI, that is also a form of activity. Now, why is it so important to make this differentiation between clinical activity and MRI activity? Because tonight's topic is on progression. And at this point in the lecture, I want you to understand that you can have activity which only shows up on the MRI and doesn't have any clinical manifestations yet. Now, progression is not when you have an attack and don't get all the way better. Sometimes people suffer an attack, and I'll use the example of optic neuritis. And they lose, let's say, God forbid, they go completely blind, 100% blind. And then they regain 50% function back. So they have a very impaired vision in their eye. That is, a, that is worsening on their neurological examination. Their neuro exam is worse. They've suffered brain damage. But that's not progression. That is incomplete recovery after activity, after an attack. When we talk about progression, we're talking about getting worse on your neuro exam, losing function in the absence of an attack, in the absence of an attack. Now, how can that happen? In order to explain it to you guys, I'm going to use an analogy. Now, full disclaimer, I am not a violent man. I own no firearms. There are no guns in my house, but in this analogy, pretend with me that I have a 12-gauge shotgun. And just to be dramatic, let's say that I've sawed off the handle, so I have this wicked weapon in my hand, and I'm going to and I'm gonna cock the shotgun, boom, and I'm going to shoot a hole in one of the walls of my house. So Dr. B has lost his mind. In fact, I'm going to shoot 10 holes in one of the structural walls of my house. And because it's such a weird, dramatic event, my family and the police decide not to patch the walls. So now my home in Columbus, Ohio, one of the structural walls has 10 holes in it. Now the house doesn't fall down, it just has 10 holes in one wall. But my home is 100 years old. Now what happens if we go another 100 years into the future? As the house ages, as the structure 
structural integrity of the home starts to diminish a little bit, which wall in my home falls first? The answer, guys, is the wall that had the holes in it to begin with. Because those areas of, of damage, which didn't make the wall fall at first, they caused structural instability. And as the house aged naturally, those areas gave out and they fell. Now, this is exactly the way I want you to understand the underpinnings of progression. Let's go back to the term activity. If you have um, three new MRI spots, those are three areas of brain damage. Whether or not they caused clinical activity, whether or not they caused an attack, they did cause brain damage. You're staring at it on the MRI. And as the brain ages over time, those areas of structural damage literally wear out. And as the brain ages and as the spinal cord ages and as those areas of damage wear out, you manifest worsening on your neuro exam separate from clinical attacks. This is progression. This is progression in MS. And until very recently, we have fought tooth and nail, desperately trying to delay, halt, prevent, stop, slow this terrible, terrible condition. And until very recently, we failed. Now, I want to tell you something. We have these terms, these terms of clinically isolated syndrome, relapsing forms of multiple sclerosis, secondary progressive, and primary progressive MS. And I dislike those terms quite significantly. To me, they're a very, very shallow outward description. And it reminds me of when someone says, oh, she's a buxom blonde. A buxom blonde tells you nothing about the human except two things. You know their hair color and one other item. But you don't know their love of music. You don't know their politics. You don't know what they cherish and what they detest. You don't understand that human being. All you know is the outward surface, which is insufficient. And saying that someone has clinically isolated syndrome, relapsing forms of MS, secondary progressive MS, primary progressive MS, to me is as shallow as saying buxom blonde. See, the reality, guys, is that all forms of multiple sclerosis progress. If you take someone who has suffered a clinically isolated syndrome where they've had one attack, they don't even technically have MS yet, and you do very, very careful neuropsychometric testing, you can identify that they have progression in cognitive impairment at the earliest time point you look. If you take the same person with clinically isolated syndrome, and you do brain volume studies, you can find that compared to healthy controls the same age, their brain is shrinking at a faster rate. So even at the earliest time point, this disease is progressive. We talk about someone having relapsing forms of MS, and we don't think about the fact that there is progression underneath, but let me tell you something, there is. The term secondary progressive MS suggests that they used to have relapses and now they're progressing, which is hogwash. Because in reality, people with secondary progressive MS have a relapsing form of disease. They have had attacks, and they could still have attacks. The difference is the age of the human and how long they've had the disease. Because as the disease and as the person goes forward in time, the likelihood they have attacks decreases, and the likelihood that they have progression in the absence of attack increases. But they still are at risk for attacks, and they can still happen. And they still can have new spots on their MRI. Now, the term primary progressive MS is a term we use when someone does not recall having had attacks. Either they've never, ever had attacks, or they can't recall because they were so, so insignificant or subclinical that they didn't really fully appreciate it. And these people manifest a progression of their disease in the absence of attacks from the get-go. Now, we have redefined these phenotypes that I've been talking about, and I want to make it clear that with the new definitions, people with primary progressive MS can have attacks because they can. People with secondary progressive MS can have attacks because they can. And here's a really important point, so I really hope you listen to the next sentence. When we do MRIs, of people with primary progressive MS in clinical trials, one-fourth of them 
have enhancing lesions on their MRI. One-fourth of them have new activity. Guys, they have activity. They don't have activity with attacks. It's not clinical, but it's still brain damage, and it's still new, and it's still happening, and we cannot ignore it any longer. Now, this is my introduction to this concept of progressive MS. And I want to shift gears, and I want to start to talk about how we monitor progression and how we treat progression. Because, yes, we can monitor, and yes, we can treat, and we should do both. How do you monitor for progressive MS? Well, number one, you talk to the human being. It's a crazy idea, but it works really, really well. The clinician needs to have a genuine conversation with the person impacted by MS. And if you listen carefully, they will tell you a story of progression. I used to golf twice a week. This is an example. I don't know how to golf. I used to golf twice a week. I was really good. In fact, on Sundays, I was in a league where we competed. And a couple times, I got a trophy. About five years ago, my friends in the league asked me to stop playing with them because I couldn't keep up. But I still would golf with my wife, and I still would golf on Wednesdays until about three years ago because Walking to the end of the golf, 18 holes, I would get so freaking tired and my balance would get so bad and my leg would go so numb that it wasn't worth it to me. And last year, I only golfed every once in a while and I only did nine holes. And this year, for the first time in my adult life, I'm not golfing. That is a story of progression. And you learn that by talking to the human being. Now, It is very possible that there's not a lot of MS neurologists on the phone right now. It is very possible, however, that there's a bunch of people impacted by MS on the phone. So if you're one of those people impacted by MS, and what I mean by that is either you have MS or your loved one has MS, I hope you're listening, because it is incumbent upon you to share with your clinician the story of progression if you're having it. You have to talk to them, and if they don't want to listen, proverbially grab them by the shirt tails and say, listen to me. Now, how else do you monitor progression? You can do it with clinical testing. Now, neurologists love the neuro exam. It takes us literally a decade to master the complexities of the neuro exam. And yet, it is not the most sensitive way of measuring progression. Look, guys, it hurts my feelings to say that to you because it took me so long, and I love my exam. But there are clinical tests that are, in fact, more sensitive than the neuro exam to pick up progression. So what are they? They're encompassed in a beautiful set of tests called the multiple sclerosis functional composite, MSFC. And the multiple sclerosis functional composite, or at least the modern versions that we use today, are exquisitely sensitive to pick up subtle change. Let me explain. The first test that I like to use is called the symbol digit modality test. SDMT, the Symbol Digit Modality Test, and it is a 90-second paper and pencil test, and it's a matching quiz. And a 20% drop on that matching quiz is clinically and statistically significant. And a score under 42 is concerning. And this is a test that anyone can administer. It takes 90 seconds, and is the most sensitive test for impairment of cognition. It is an exquisite test to monitor someone for progression in an invisible symptom. And why do I say invisible symptom? Because cognition is a bit invisible to the naked eye, unless you dive deep. And the simple digit modality test is an extraordinary way of doing that. What else can we do clinically to pick up progression? We can pick up progression for people that are still ambulating. How do we do that? We walk with them. We have them walk, in fact, 25 feet. And many of you, I hope, have heard of the timed 25-foot walk. It is what it sounds like. You have the person stand at the starting gates and say, walk as quickly as you can safely. Hit the stopwatch as they cross the threshold, and they walk, not run, walk as fast as they can down the hall, 25 feet. The average person can do this in about four seconds. This is a healthy population. And in the setting of MS, a 20% slowing is statistically and clinically significant. And this is an exquisitely sensitive test. It's actually better than the neuro exam to pick up subtle progression of neurological disability. There's another test that I adore, and it looks at hand function. Many people impacted by MS may not be able to ambulate on their own. 
they may benefit from sitting on a scooter or using a wheelchair. And by the way, I hope you noticed what I just said. I said using a wheelchair, not a wheelchair person, not a wheelchair. It's a human being that's using a wheelchair because they're smart, because it's hard to get around, and so they use the wheelchair for their benefit. But my point here is about hand function. Hands are really, really important. And if you don't have your legs, hands are even more important. And so we want to monitor hand function, we want to monitor arm function, and we want to know if it's not going so hot. And so there's a test for that too. It's called the nine-hole peg test. The nine-hole peg test is a really, really easy and fast test. It takes maybe, I don't know, 20-some 20, 20 seconds to complete. And it reminds me, if you've ever been to the, the restaurant Cracker Barrel, where they have the little peg board with the pegs in it. And what you do is, is when you hit the stopwatch, you take nine pegs and put them in each of nine holes on this board in front of you, and then you take them all out, and you do it for time. And a 20% change is both clinically and statistically significant. And so not only do you talk to the human being and listen for a story of progression, but you can do testing, such as cognitive testing, symbol digit modality test, walking tests, timed 25 for walk, and arm function test, the nine-hole peg test. And these tests in aggregate are more sensitive to pick up progression than the entire neuro exam. But we don't stop there. We can use what I refer to as paraclinical evidence, which is fancy talk for uh, tests and imaging studies. And so the very most useful test is the MRI. Now, very few red-blooded humans adore cramming themselves into a tunnel where they feel claustrophobic and can't move their head and being told, stop moving, stop moving, as the machine makes really loud, obnoxious noises. Bang, 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 bing, bing, bing. And what that machine is doing is it's taking a picture of the holiest of holies, the brain, the supercomputer. It's taking a picture of the spinal cord. And if we see new spots, we're seeing new brain damage. And that's not okay. And that is the precursor to progression 15 years later. And so we don't want new spots. We don't want new brain damage. We don't want new damage to the spinal cord. And obtaining an MRI is important. And it's important if you have relapsing MS, and gosh darn it, it is important if you have progressive MS. And not just the brain, guys. We have to look at the spinal cord. It's very important to look at the spinal cord. The cervical spinal cord in specific, but also the thoracic spinal cord from time to time is extremely useful to take a look at for this reason. I'm now going to talk about some new emerging technologies that allow us to monitor progression. Emerging technology number one still has to do with the MRI machine, and it looks at brain volume. Now, I assume that most people on the call tonight are over the age of 18. And if that is true, I am very saddened to share with you the reality that every single one of us after the age of 18 have programmed brain shrinkage. Just like the skin gets thinner as we age, just like my hair falls out a lot as I age, the brain shrinks. It's supposed to. But people with untreated MS have accelerated brain shrinkage upwards of 10 times faster than normal. And with new MRI technology, we are able to measure brain volume. That's right. We can measure the rate of brain shrinkage. It's not a perfect science yet, guys. It's not exactly perfect. We're still working out the details. But there's even um, commercially available imaging packages that your hospital system can put on their scanners that give you a readout. We, where I work at Ohio Health, literally do this with every brain MRI that we obtain. And looking at the rates of brain shrinkage is really bringing the future to bear now. Because if we identify that the rate of brain shrinkage is too fast, in my opinion, that is actionable. That means that we need to do something. What are we going to do? I'll tell you in a little bit. Now, there's some more technology I wanted to share with you. There's another imaging test called the OCT, or Ocular Coherence Tomography. OCT is a vision test. You sit in um, a machine and it shines a laser in your eye. It shines a light in your eye and it measures the back of the eye called the retinal nerve fiber layer. And the back of the eye, the thickness of the retinal nerve fiber layer correlates with brain volume loss, correlates with brain shrinkage, 
It also correlates with disability progression. And it takes about 10 seconds to obtain the images, and they're highly reliable. We have one of these machines in our clinic, and we use it to help monitor patients. The next piece of technology to monitor progressive MS is not yet prime time. It's the future, but it is literally around the corner. And it is a blood test. That's right, a blood test called neurofilament light chain. Let me tell you a little bit about neurofilament light chain because this is super exciting. When an axon, which is part of one of the cells, well, let me back up. The brain's made up of a bunch of cells, and a lot of them are called neurons. And the neuron has a section to it called an axon. And when the neuron dies or the axon dies, it breaks up in little pieces. And you can measure neurofilament light chain, which is some of the inside guts of the axon, because it gets spilled into the spinal fluid and it gets spilled into the serum. And so you can measure it. And it turns out that when people have activity and when they're getting worse over time, neurofilament light chain goes up. And we are now getting better and better in research measuring neurofilament light chain both in the spinal fluid but also in the blood, in the serum. And it is my strong belief that within the next five so years, we will be able to commercially monitor patients using a blood test, neurofilament light chain. That is super exciting, and it's right around the corner. And it's going to help us do a better job of identifying both activity and progression. Now, I'm going to shift gears on you because I want to talk about how we treat progression in MS. And yes, we can treat progression in MS. It is our goal to make you the most awesome version of you despite having MS. And we need to use every trick and trap and tip that we can think of to slow this disease down. The first thing I want to talk about is a concept called brain health. Brain health. And we want the brain to age naturally. We want the, the brain to shrink at a normal rate. And we don't want to do anything to hasten the shrinking, to speed up the shrinking. We don't want to do anything to risk the health of the brain. Smoking cigarettes is the very best way to hasten, to speed up brain volume loss and to speed up MS. And maybe some of you on the call don't know that smoking can speed up MS by almost 50% according to some studies. Smoking cigarettes is the best way to increase, to speed up, to worsen progression. And so the flip is also true. Stopping smoking or not smoking slows down the disease rate. This is true. This has been proven with science. And it's not limited just to smoking. Other cardiovascular risk factors, heart and the arteries, including the arteries of the brain, hasten the, the shrinkage of the brain. They make the brain get older faster. And so paying attention to cardiovascular risk factors, such as controlling diabetes, avoiding morbid obesity, addressing high cholesterol and high blood pressure, along with not smoking, are very meaningful ways of slowing progression. I hope you guys hear what I'm saying. I'm not talking about quality of life. I'm talking about the rate at which you get worse from MS. You literally can slow it down. Also, I want to call out the fact that people with MS who exercise as part of their lifestyle have a slower progression compared to those that don't. People with MS that exercise as part of their lifestyle slow the rate of disability progression compared to those that don't. And so it is not namby-pamby or silly to talk about cardiovascular risk factors. The next topic, which is equally as important, is addressing depression. People with MS are twice as likely to suffer from depression compared to the general population, which is way more. And it turns out that depression speeds up MS. It covers everything ug ugly. It ruins quality of life. But in studies, we have found that depressed people with MS get worse faster. They get neurologically worse faster. And guys, depression is treatable. And so if you are undertreated, if you're being treated for depression but it's not working, address this with your clinician because it can make a really big impact. Now, I now want to shift my attention to medications that have been shown to slow progression. Medications that have been shown to slow progression. Disease-modifying therapies, disease-modifying therapies, particularly the newer disease-modifying therapies, are able to slow disability progression. 
And it's not just because they stop attacks. And it is not just because they stop new MRI spots. But as I've explained to you, if you can prevent a new spot from occurring at age 30, it doesn't cause brain damage that will then wear out at age 60. So even if all the drug did was stop or slow new spots and attacks, it would be very, very meaningful. But that's not all they do. And some of you remember two years ago when something magical happened. The very first drug was approved for primary progressive MS. Now, I was a clinical investigator in this trial, which is called the Oratorio trial, where we studied a drug that is trade name Ocrevus. The real name is Ocrelizumab. And I enrolled seven of our own patients here in Columbus, Ohio, with PPMS into that trial. And as an investigator, I knew the results, and I didn't care. I paid quite a bit of money to travel to Barcelona, Spain, to sit in the audience and listen to the presentation. Now, this might surprise some of you. I am not a real guy. I don't like sports and the foosball and the basketballs and all these things. I don't follow that stuff. But that day, I learned what it felt like to watch my team win because I sat in the audience and I cried. And I listened as they demonstrated the data that they were able to slow the disability progression of PPMS by 24% compared to placebo. We've never been able to do that before, and we can do it now. They demonstrated in that same trial that they could slow brain shrinkage by 18% with ocrelizumab as compared to placebo. Unbelievable. And there's another really cool statistic, which is not talked about enough, and it's something called NEP. No evidence of progression. Sounds pretty awesome. NEP, no evidence of progression, means over a three-month time period, no attack – oh, excuse me, that's wrong. Over a three-month time period, no change on the neuro exam, no slowing by 20% of speed of walking, and no slowing of 20% of, of your hand function, that nine-hole peg test. And what they demonstrated is the people with primary progressive MS that took this drug, Ocrevus, Ocrelizumab, had a 50% chance higher of achieving NEP compared to placebo. And so that heralded in a new era of a disease-modifying therapy that was proven beyond doubt to slow progression, not just in relapsing forms of MS, but in what I sometimes refer to as the form first of MS, primary progressive MS. It is exciting that this week there is a new drug, saponamod, which is similar to Gelenia. It's kind of a Gelenia Me Too in some regards. And it has an indication for relapsing forms of MS, which means they call out that it's used in clinically isolated syndrome, relapsing multiple sclerosis, and in secondary progressive multiple sclerosis with attacks. Now, my point in bringing this up is not to talk specifically about saponamod as it were, but to say that the entire world is now focusing their attention on addressing progressive forms of multiple sclerosis. This year, I attended the Ectom's meeting, as I do every year. This year, it was in, Bar excuse me, it was in Berlin a really cool city, and I'm, I'm sharing with you that 10,000-plus MS neurologists were all discussing progression. That was the hottest of topics, what's going on with progression. And I think that you will see, I know that you will see over the next several years, more and more therapies being tested and coming out specifically to treat progression. One more drug I want to talk about is not actually a drug. It's a vitamin, B7, biotin. Now, biotin is a vitamin that's sold over the counter at three milligrams a pill, and it's supposed to make your hair stronger and your nails stronger, and I am darn near bald, and so I missed the boat, and I should have been taking biotin years ago. Maybe I would still have long, flowing locks, but probably not. It turns out in a really cool study, when they gave people with primary progressive MS high doses of biotin, I'm talking 300 milligrams a day, it slowed disability progression. Amazing. Moreover, they found that it slowed the rates of brain shrinkage. We are no longer in an era of diagnose and adios. We are no longer in an era of you have MS, too bad for you. We are no longer in an era of we can treat relapsing MS, but we can't treat progression. That's not true either because now we can face this head on. And I want to sum up my discussion with you today with a call to action a call to action 
I need you to do something. I need you to become aware of something and to fight against it. So if you're listening, please, please take to heart what I'm about to say. I need you to identify therapeutic inertia, and when you see it, I need you to call it out. What is therapeutic inertia? Well, I'll tell you, it's destroying people with MS. It's causing people with MS to become disabled. It's causing people with MS to lose their jobs. Therapeutic inertia was coined many, many years ago in cardiovascular literature in the heart, and it was identified as following. Someone has high blood pressure, and they go to see their doctor, and their doctor puts them on a medicine to lower their blood pressure, and they come back, and they still have high blood pressure, and they don't change the medicine. That is an example of therapeutic inertia, where you identify that there's something that's actionable, and you don't act. And therapeutic inertia is rampant in multiple sclerosis. It happens every day, and it happens the most in progressive MS because doctors and patients and parties alike will have this uh, uh, attitude of, well, it's progression. There's nothing we can do, which, as I just explained to you, is false. There are three bad actors that are culpable in therapeutic inertia, and I'm going to share all three with you right now. Number one, People impacted with MS are guilty of therapeutic inertia. Now, I'm not pointing fingers or, or, or trying to be mean, but all too often, a person doesn't want to upset their clinician, and so they minimize their symptoms. They finally figured out how to pay for their drug or how to make it palatable and tolerable, and they, they don't want to say anything because if they, if they say the drug's not working, then they're going to have to start all over. They don't want to admit they've had an attack because they hate the steroids. My point is there are various reasons why sometimes – People with MS are not forthcoming, and they participate in therapeutic inertia. And if you have done that, you're normal. You're human. But I don't want you to do it anymore because it's making you worse. Now, patients can contribute to therapeutic inertia, but they are not the worst actors. There's two other parties that are much worse. The second one are third-party payers. Third-party payers sometimes create systemic therapeutic inertia by creating step edits where they require someone with MS to, quote, fail a lower efficacy drug before they're able to get on a higher efficacy drug, which would help them more if they started it early. Now, they are not the worst actor either. It's not patients and it's not payers who are the worst actors, the most culpable as it relates to therapeutic inertia. Who are these people that are the worst? Guys, it's me. It's doctors, it's clinicians, it's MS neurologists and general neurologists who are not acting when they see progression. And I am giving you a call to action this evening. When you see therapeutic inertia, when your doctor says, well, there's not a lot we can do, I want you to say, nuh uh, there is something we can do. And I want you to push the envelope because I want you to fight back against therapeutic inertia. My name is Aaron Boster, and thank you for learning about MS with me. I am delighted for the opportunity to speak with you today, and I'm hopeful that I have helped uh, create some thoughts. And I'm also hopeful that I've helped create some questions. And so, Chris, our host, if you please open the lines proverbially, and let's start to field some questions. As a matter of fact, we already do have some questions for you. Uh, but first, as mentioned earlier, to ask a question – you must connect online. Go to readytalk.com, click join meeting, and use the access code 7766805. For those of you already online, if you have a question for Dr. Boster, please use the blue online chat button to submit your question now. And let's get into some of those questions, shall we? Let's do uh, our, it, first question, our first question comes from Lynn Robinson. Are folks with MS more prone to infections like MRSA? Lynn, how do you do? Um, and if you guys write in, please share where you're writing in from. I love sharing about this global online community, this national online community. And so if you write in a question, do me a kind favor and share where you're coming from. Now, Lynn asks, are people with MS at higher risk to have infections like MRSA? And the answer is not really. People with MS have a heightened immune system. Their immune system is overly active. It's so active, it's actually attacking themselves. And oftentimes, people with MS 
have less colds than the, the other people in their homes. Now, as we age, I'm not talking about MS, I'm talking about age, our immune systems dampen, and we're more susceptible to getting infections as we start to get a bit older. Also, some of the MS medications can dampen our immune system. They do that on purpose, but in doing so, they can increase the risk of infections. And so certain MS medicines, certain MS disease-modifying therapies can place you at increased risk. And those are very specific for the given medications that we're talking about. Um, and so one that comes to mind is alentuzumab, codenamed for Lymtrata. And people that receive Lymtrata for the first couple months take a medicine called acyclovir because they're at increased risk of having shingles. Um, and that's just an example. Thank you for the question, Lynn. That was fantastic. Chris, how about another one? Yes, uh, we have another question uh, from Cheryl Hoffman. She actually has several questions for you. Um, I'm going to start with, uh, obviously, her first one. I really struggle with taking a DMD. I have tried every one except Jelenia and Ocrevus with a progressive form now. I am known for certain to have had MS since 1996, age 28, but most likely to have had it since my teens, which means 35 years. What are your thoughts on this? Is it, is it helpful at all, or am I making myself even more sick with side effects of now Tecfidera as well as so many MS symptoms? So thank you for writing in, thank you for the question, and thank you for sharing openly your story. I can't give you specific advice for you because I can't see you, I can't examine you, I haven't read over your chart, I haven't looked at your MRIs. And so I can't answer your question specifically for you, but I will attempt to answer the question more generally. Speaking generally, would I deny someone who's in their 60s a DMT? Speaking generally, would I deny someone a disease-modifying therapy because they've had the disease for 35 years? Hell no. Absolutely not. I would not do that. I would absolutely want to treat you. I would want to treat you, and you name two highly effective drugs that you've never tried. In my strong opinion, Jelenia is superior to Tecfidera. That's my opinion. In my strong opinion, Ocrevus is one of the most effective medicines that we've ever had ever. And it has been shown, as I just demonstrated to you in our chit-chat, that it can work not just in relapsing MS, but also in progressive forms of MS. So would I encourage you to consider them? Yes, 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 I would. In considering the risk-benefit, and you say, well, I'm concerned about potential infections, we have a 100% likelihood that you have MS. You already told me that. There is a 100% chance that you have MS which means there's a 100% chance that you will progress if we don't do anything. And we're talking about a theoretical concern of a possible infection against a 100% chance of actually having the condition. And now, in 2019, we have medicines that can impact progression. So my answer to you is, speaking in generalities, boy, I would really like to treat someone like you. She has a follow-up question. Awesome. I heard yet. I heard yesterday about a second MS drug for progressive MS, secondary progressive, but of course it is $88,000 a year. Wondering what you think about this new med. So the new medicine isn't all that new in my opinion. It's called Suponamod, and it's a Gelenia Me Too drug. It's an S1 um, receptor modulator, just like Gelenia. This is a bit more selective, and so it dropped out one of the receptor sites. And they studied this medicine uh, in a unique way, and it has a label which lets it be used in clinically isolated syndrome. It has a label that allows it to be used in relapsing forms of MS, including secondary progressive MS with relapses. It is not the first medicine available for secondary progressive MS. It's the second. The first medicine available for secondary progressive MS is mitoxantrone, which came out in the year 2000, 19 years ago. And so it is the second medicine that's available for secondary progressive MS. And the price point, 88000 well, that's a really large number. These are terribly expensive medicines. But I'll share with you that manufacturers and foundations are here to assist. I don't have 
a cohort of people in my clinic that I follow that are billionaires. I take care of normal human beings that work normal jobs, and they, we are able to find ways of paying for the medicine. One comment is that this medicine, Saponamod, is a derivative of Jelenia, and Jelenia will soon go generic in the next couple of years. And so I'm going to let you connect the dots. That was an excellent question. Thank you for asking it. Next up, we have uh, Nanette uh, Colomb. She's from uh, New Orleans, uh, currently on Ocrevus, and takes a high dose of uh, biotin, uh, 300 milligrams a day, and low dose uh, naltrexone, 4.5 milligrams a day. Uh, she is thinking about uh, HSCT. I have been told that it does not work well on older people. I am 57. Is HSCT not considered effective in older people because they generally had MS for longer periods of time, or is it because the body is less resilient at 57? I have only had MS symptoms since January 2015, diagnosed November 2016. So MS-wise, I am young, but age-wise, age-wise oldish. No one is able to tell me what sort of stage my disease is in. I have no MRI activity since my initial MRIs, but my mobility has deteriorated. Wonderful, complex question. First of all, I disagree with you that 57 is old. So let's just put that out there. I don't think 57 is old. 57 is the new 37. Second of all, somebody loves you. Somebody has put you on a highly effective therapy, Ocrevus, which works both to treat relapses and progression. They've put you on biotin, which, as I discussed earlier, slows brain shrinkage and disability, and they're giving you low-dose naltrexone, which I won't talk too much about right now. Somebody loves you. The third thing I'll say is congratulations on having stable MRIs. That's really cool. I hope you also are talking about stable MRIs of the spine. You, you um, ask an important question about hem hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, and that's what that H abbreviation stands for, a stem cell transplant. And here is my opinion about stem cell transplants. I think in the future, maybe 10 years from now, stem cell transplantation will become a thing to treat MS. I think that today, 2019, we should never, ever, ever, ever do a stem cell transplant outside of a clinical trial. And I bring this up because of a very important concern. There are predatory, horrible human beings who participate in something called stem cell tourism, where you can travel to exotic places like Mexico and, and India and Chicago, and you can give someone $25,000 and they will do a, quote, stem cell transplant, end quote. Now, the good thing is a lot of these stem cell tourism places are bogus. And the reason that's good is because a real stem cell transplant carries mortality risk with it. It can kill you. And so I strongly, strongly encourage you to never, ever, ever, ever consider stem cell tourism. I only think that stem cells, stem cell transplantation should be done for MS in 2019 in the context of clinical trials research. Now, you do bring up an important point that most of the research done, and there's only been a couple hundred patients worldwide that have had this for MS, just a couple hundred. That's really a very small number, but most of them had really early MS. They were a very young age. We're talking 20s, and they had horribly aggressive disease with attack after attack after attack and new spots on the MRI and new spots on the MRI, and the drugs weren't slowing anything down. And... A friend of mine named Mark Freeman, a wonderful MS neurologist in Canada, published a trial a couple of years ago, and it made a big splash in Facebook, and many of you probably saw it. And he looked at 28 of these rare patients, rare, very young from a chronologic age, and very, very aggressive disease. And there was only one death, but that's a really big deal to me. Now, many of those patients fared very well, but they are not the phenotype that you're describing. My answer to you is that I would only consider a stem cell transplant if you found a clinical trial that you matched for. Otherwise, I would encourage you to continue on the wonderful therapies that you're on. I would encourage you 
to consider brain health. Make sure you're not smoking. Make sure that although your legs aren't working as well, that you're exercising. Maybe get in the swimming pool and do water aerobics. Make sure that you're controlling other cardiovascular risk factors. And make sure that you can do everything that we currently know in 2019 to slow the progression of your disease. Again, excellent question. Thank you for asking. I have a question from Barb. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm going to mangle, mangle this. Barb Giuliano. Uh, what about the side effects of Ocrevus, uh, potential malig malignancies? So that's a wonderful question. Um, and so uh, to touch on it, when we did the clinical trials for ocrelizumab, we did three trials, and we compared ocrelizumab either to um, standard of care, which is a shot, or to placebo. And none of the people in the placebo or the shot arms of the trials got breast cancer. Six women in the ocrelizumab arm got breast cancer. So everyone, including myself, said, whoa, Nellie, is there a risk for breast cancer, question mark? When we look at the number of women in the trial, and the ages of the women, and we calculate the expected rate of breast cancer, it was six, the same number. The EMA, which is the European FDA, said no signal, and there's nothing in their label about cancer at all. In the United States, the American label, they say that we're not sure if there's a signal until we recommend standard cancer screening, nothing different or special. Now, Ocrevus has now been out for several years. And the risk has actually gotten smaller. When you look at the data, it's, it's more reassuring. I personally don't think that ocrelizumab puts people at risk for breast cancer. That is my own personal opinion. And I recommend that patients with breasts have self-breast exams and have mammograms of the appropriate ages. Because if we were to determine, God forbid, that there is a signal, my patients will have been monitored and will be safe. And that is the only cancer question which has come up to date with ocrelizumab. Now, listen, guys, everything is a risk benefit. And I am not telling you to be cavalier with your health. I am not telling you to throw caution to the wind. But we know the MS is real. We know that with 100% likelihood. And so please, please, please place the risk benefit of a drug inside the context of the risk of the disease. Thank you for the question. Uh, we have another question by Kathy Facone. Is biotin contraindicated during or after chemotherapy for uterine cancer? So I can't answer that question because I am not a cancer doctor. And what I would encourage you to do is to talk to two important people in your life. Important person number one, the oncologist that's treating the uterine cancer. Important person number two, the neurologist treating the MS. And I would encourage you to get them together on the telephone and have a chit-chat and discuss the risk-benefit of taking biotin. I suspect that it's okay, but I don't know that. And so I would ask you to have them chit-chat. One comment about biotin that I do want to make is that when you take biotin, you, you develop a very high level of biotin in the blood. Certain blood tests, as it turns out, use biotin as part of the test. So they use, um, please mute the line, I hear sirens, or maybe I'm having an auditory hallucination. Yeah, that, that's not on my end. Oh, okay. Um, I, I, maybe I had an auditory hallucination where I heard sirens, but they're over now, so I'm feeling better. Yeah. What I was trying to no, say No, I heard is, the sirens that, too, but they weren't for oh, me. Oh, good. Good, good. Okay. <laughs> so I'm glad they're not for you. Biotin can cause certain lab tests to be abnormal. Now, please understand. It doesn't mean you're abnormal. It means it's monkeyed with the test itself. And so a really good example is thyroid. If you're taking ultra-high doses of biotin, you have to stop the biotin three days to a week prior to any blood test because if you get, say, a thyroid test, it'll come back abnormal when there's actually nothing wrong. And there's a couple other tests like that. And so my recommendation is that people that are taking high-dose biotin stop about a week before any lab test or doctor's visit, so when they give blood, the results aren't abnormal. Excellent question. Thank you. I have a question from Susan B. Uh, she is from Columbus, Ohio, though she uh, says she's not a patient of yours. Uh, what do you think of neuroplasticity? Can it work for MS foot drop? So that's a great question, um, and it's nice to talk to another Columbusite uh, here in sunny Columbus, Ohio. I'm joking <laughs> uh, because it's not so sunny today. 
although it didn't rain very much. And the question is, what about neuroplasticity? Now, neuroplasticity is this concept, which is very real, that the brain can rewire itself and the spinal cord can rewire itself. Now, we don't do it often. Our brains aren't really, really good at it, but it can happen. And it happens the best when we're young. I'm not talking about MS. I'm talking about chronologic age. And so the old saying that you can't teach an old dog new tricks is false. You can rewire. It's very challenging. It may not be complete, but it's important to try. How do we try? Working with a neurophysical therapist. So at Ohio Health here in Columbus, at Mount Carmel in Columbus, at Ohio State in Columbus, there are outstanding neurophysical therapists. And if you're not working with one, you need to. And they are going to do some things that are really cool. They're going to work with you to overcome the foot drop, to strengthen the muscles. They might stimulate the muscles with electricity. There's all kinds of things that we can do to try to improve and optimize your gait mechanics. Now, let me push a little bit further. Let's pretend that in this particular situation, we can't. Let's pretend that in this particular situation, we're not able to create neuroplasticity and make that foot drop better. There are still ways of accommodating. For example, an ankle foot orthosis is a really cool piece of, uh, piece of plastic or Kevlar or metal. There's all kinds of different materials. And it's, imagine an L that fits against your calf into your, into your shoe uh, and you, your foot sits on it. And it cocks your foot up so that the turf monster doesn't grab it. It pulls your foot up so that you can clear the ground. There are many, many ways of optimizing and improving functional gait. And working with a neurophysical therapist is a great start. It's very nice to talk with you. Uh, nice to talk to another Columbusite. Thank you for the question. I have a, another question here from John DeQuisto. Um, is there an age limit where you should stop a DMT? My doctor says 70 is a cutoff. So I don't believe in being ageist, John. Um, I have a YouTube channel, as uh, our, our host Chris brought up, and I have a video uh, answering the question, should we stop drugs at age 60? And uh, you can check that video out on my YouTube channel. But to answer briefly, I don't think that there's an age cutoff where you hit a magical age and suddenly you're not allowed to take a medicine. That's nonsense. I have high cholesterol, John. So, my, you know, thanks, Dad, I have high cholesterol. How long am I supposed to take a cholesterol-lowering agent? Well, I don't stop at 70. I keep going because if I were to stop, then the risks would increase. And in my opinion, there isn't a magic age where we stop MS medicines. I will share with you that as we age, our immune systems get quieter. And I will share with you that after the age of 70, MS can slow down. And so I think always age 30, age 50, age 70, we have to have a risk-benefit discussion. There's no magic age where you stop, but there is a constant discussion about the risk-benefit. And the risks at a certain age for a particular individual may supersede the benefit, but that is done on a case-by-case -case basis. So I want to fight against ageism. I want to fight against therapeutic inertia, and I want to consider the individual human as an individual and weigh the risk-benefit. John, I have some patients that are well over 60. Some of them are in their 70s, and we talk about this in clinic. We discuss with the families. We discuss with loved ones, and sometimes, collectively, we decide the better part of valor is to stop. Oftentimes, we decide the better part of valor is to keep on keeping on. And I want that to be an individual decision. I do not want a doctor. I do not want a government. I do not want a, a group of, of neurologists writing some consensus statement to tell you that at a certain age you're not allowed. Excellent question. Thank you for asking it. Okay. We've gone over time a little bit here. We still have a few questions in the queue. I'm going well, to let's do the questions in the queue, and then maybe we'll call it quits. What do you think? I want to get those questions answered. Okay, we've got eight questions left in the queue, so we're going All right. to uh, let's go do it to it, guys. We'll go as quick right. as I can. All right. First, uh, the next question is from uh, Sherry Gelanders. Dr. Boster, you mentioned obesity as a risk factor. Do the MS diets that people follow slow progression as well, in your opinion? I'm thinking of the OMS diet, Best Bet, and Swank diets. 
So thank you for asking the question of diets. Uh, this is a very hot topic. Again, I have uh, several YouTube videos where I talk about diet and MS. And so if you haven't checked those out, you might want to. I do not believe that there is a diet that exists presently which slows progression of MS. Let me say that again. No diet slows progression of MS. I do believe that diets can help us feel better. They can improve quality of life. And in particular, I believe that diets can improve energy in MS, which is really, really important. Um, check out my YouTube channel. Look at those videos on nutrition and diet, and hopefully that provides a more comprehensive explanation. Thank you. All right. Next question is from uh, Kay Hertz. Uh, diagnosed in 1996, I believe at the age 30. Uh, took Avonex for 21 years. Developed Hashimoto's and tested positive for neutralizing antibodies. Uh, two infusions of Tisabri, very bad reaction. Do not want to go on infusion. Previous breast cancer and strong family history of cardio issues. Thoughts on, Al on Albagio? So, again, I can't give you an answer for you. I don't have enough information. I don't have your um, MRIs in front of me. I can't examine you myself. I, I can't look through the details of your history. Um, I think that there are 17 FDA, 18 FDA-approved medicines to treat MS, and you haven't listed 18 medicines, which means you don't know that you're not going to be able to tolerate some of those medicines. Would I try something? Yes, I would. Do I think Abagio is a nice medicine? I do. Thank you for the question. And don't give up and don't stop trying. And fight against therapeutic inertia. You have MS, and it's not going to stop, and so you don't want to stop fighting back. Uh, next question is from Sid Stewart. Uh, Love the presentation. Diagnosed in uh, 2018. Taken Ocrevus since 2018. Could exposure to pesticides and other Monsanto products could be more than 50% responsible? It doesn't appear so. There's been studies that have looked at Agent Orange. There's studies that have looked at pesticides. There is no epidemiologic association between those and the cause of MS. That being said, we haven't nailed down the exact cause of MS yet, and so there are some unknowns out there. But to date, science would tell us the answer to your question is no. Next question is from uh, Mashika Driver. Uh, she is from Fredericksburg, Virginia, and she asks, what of, these DMT, what of these DMTs are most effective on improving walking? I also take low-dose uh, naltrexone. What, what is your take on IDN? So there isn't one DMT which is ubiquitously improving walking for all people. I have seen miraculous things with many different drugs. And as my friend Chris Legank likes to say, every drug's hit it out of the park at least once. And so I think that it's, it's very individualized. I do, however, want to share a, a symptomatic medicine called 4-aminopyridine or Ampira. Overseas it's called Fampira. And this is a medicine where only about a third of people with MS tend to respond. But when you respond, it's awesome because people can walk longer without having motor fatigue. They can walk faster. In fact, it buttresses against heat sensitivity and motor fatigue. And if you haven't checked out that medicine, it's certainly worth asking your doctor about. Thank you. Uh, the next one is from Trisha Yan. Um, if unable to do an MRI because of non-compatible defibrillator, what options are there in imaging studies to monitor MS progression? Uh, Tish is from Las Vegas. Wow. Um, I love your city. <laughs> um, and I think that this is a very real situation. It happens sometimes. We have uh, medicine by Edison. We have devices in our body, and they're not MRI compatible. Well, MS existed long before MRIs did, and we treated MS before. What do we do? Well, remember I mentioned that OCT, ocular coherence tomography, the OCT machine, the eye test machine? That is a machine that measures the thickness of the back of the eye, and that correlates with disability and with MRI brain shrinkage. And so that is absolutely a test that I would explore. That can be done by your MS neurologist. By the way, there are some really, really top-notch MS neurologists practicing out in Nevada. There's a couple amazing um, doctors from the Cleveland Clinic that are out there, and they're just to die for. Um, also, I, I shared with you that I believe very soon 
we will have neurofilament and light chain available in serum as a commercial test. It's not available right now, but I literally think it's within the next couple of years. And that will be another awesome sauce way of measuring your disease. So stay tuned and do not give up. Next question, please. We have April Law from Virginia. Uh, I have had multiple attacks of optic neuritis since 2010. I have a few chronic demyelinating plaques on brain MRI, but no 100% MS diagnosis yet. We'll be starting Copaxone. Is there a better or more suitable medication I should consider asking about? And she also asks, are you aware of any MS clinics in or around Roanoke, Virginia? So I am aware of, let me think. Um, I can't off the top of my head think of an MS center nearby, but that doesn't mean there isn't one. I just, I I can't on the fly think of one. I was going to make a joke and say there's an airport in Roanoke and you can come visit me in Columbus, but I won't make that joke. But you are welcome to come visit me. (laughs) Um, The the question was an interesting one, and I'm not going to share with you a better drug to discuss. I am going to share with you a diagnosis to discuss because there are cousins of multiple sclerosis. There are cousins that are actually different, and they're treated differently. There's a cousin called neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder, or NMO spectrum disorder, and there's a newly discovered cousin called anti-MOG syndrome. And both NMO and anti-MOG are um, characterized by recurrent bouts of optic neuritis. And so if your neurologist has yet to check for NMO or anti-MOG, it is incumbent upon them that they do that before they move forward. Thank you for the question. And our last question is from Cheryl Hoffman, and she asks, 20 years ago when I was officially diagnosed, my then neurologist told me he felt a cure for MS was just around the corner. When do you think this is going to happen, and what exactly is a cure? So that was a great question to end on because I disagree with your neurologist 20 years ago. I do not think that we will find a cure for MS in my lifetime. I'm not saying that to be disparaging. I'm trying to be honest. And the reason I say that to you is our understanding of MS and our understanding of the immune system isn't complete yet. We haven't even fully understood it. We have come a long way. I mean a really long way. And I think that a realistic goal isn't to cure MS, but it's to make MS boring. I want to give you an example. There's a different condition that used to be fatal. And when people got this condition, they died because they lost their kidneys. It's a condition called diabetes. People used to die from diabetes. It was a death sentence. Now, you don't even know your girlfriend has diabetes unless you happen to have chocolate cake with her after lunch. And she pulls out a little pen, and she injects herself, and you say, honey, what are you doing? She says, oh, I'm giving myself my insulin. And we have made diabetes boring. It's not cool to have diabetes, and people with diabetes have to pay attention to a lot of things, just like with MS. And people with diabetes have to take medicines on a regular basis, just like MS. But that is an autoimmune condition, which has become boring. And I think that within our lifetime, it is completely and utterly reasonable that we make MS boring. Now, I don't want to define cure because I don't think that's um, on the table at present. But I do think there's another term that's on the table, and that's the term remission. I'm not talking about relapsing, remitting MS. I'm talking about the term remission as it appears in the dictionary, as it applies to oncology, cancer. And in cancer literature, we define remission as follows. Five years with no discernible disease activity in the absence of treatment. And I think that we are ever approaching that as a reality. I do think that within my lifetime, I do think in some cases even now, we're starting to see people that are fitting that definition. Very, very exciting. Now, if I understood, Chris, that concludes our questions. With your permission... With your permission, Um, I want to, again, say thank you. I want to say thank you to MS Focus and the MS Foundation. You are a godsend, and I am so grateful that you exist. I am so grateful that you have such a positive and profound presence for people impacted by MS. My family didn't have you many, many years ago, and so many families benefit from you today. 
My name is Aaron Boster, and I want to thank you all for learning about MS with me. It is MS Awareness Month. Today is a special day as we celebrate Progressive MS Day. And take care, have a wonderful evening, and I look forward to talking to you on the airways sometime in the future. Good night. And that is all the time we have for now. If you missed any part of this teleconference, it will be replayed on msfocusradio.org and available on demand. Follow MS Focus on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for times and access information. Our sincere thanks to our sponsors for their support of National MS Education Awareness Month, to all of our callers for your participation, and especially to Aaron Boster. Thank you so much for the time you spent to prepare and share this information with us this evening. Good night.